Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Amber Case. Amber studies the interaction between humans and computers and how technology is changing everyday life. Amber was named one of Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30 and Fast Company's most influential women in technology. She has done so many things. She was named the National Geographic Emerging Explorer. She won the Claude Shannon Innovation Award from Bell's Lab. She was a co-founder and CEO of GeoLoki, a location-based software company. Right now, she's a 2021 Mozilla Fellow, and she's working on the future of money, alternative business models for the web, and creator compensation. That sounds so cool. She's an advisor to Unlock Protocol and Puma Browser. Uh, we'll be sharing all of her social media links at the uh, on the post for this. But uh, hi, Amber, and welcome to the Cool Tools Podcast. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm really, really delighted. Um, to hear about what you want to share um, and hear more about what you're up to these days. Sure, that sounds great. Amber, why don't you just get started uh, telling us about uh, your first tool and, and why you like it, what it means to you, all that good stuff. Okay, well, the first tool is very straightforward. It is a light switch. And the reason I, why I like a light switch is because as a really small kid, it's something that uh, my parents would lift me up to reach and I could turn on and off the light. And I think as a kid that gives, for me at least, it gave me a feeling of control over the universe. You know, here is, uh, you know, let there be light and there was light. Uh, but really, it's interesting because the history of electricity is that you don't have to be an electrician to use a light switch. You just have a simple, you know, you, even if you, you know, you get home late at night, it's dark, you're in an unfamiliar place, you can kind of tap the wall and, and find uh, a few various kinds of light switches. And for me, it's kind of an example of a calm technology, you know, something that's there when you need it, it doesn't draw attention to itself when you don't need it. Um, the complexity is, is hidden behind the scenes and we really respect, uh, you know, the, the, the electricity that's dangerous, but the user interface is, is straightforward so much that we don't care, you know, and, and that invisible technology that uh, I think that's really crucial to kind of re-examine and revisit these, these mundane objects in our life and consider just how brilliant they are. Do you, what do you think of the new light switches, which have, um, they're programmable or they dim or they uh, set a timer automatically. So we have some in our bathrooms and the, the, the shock to me was here's a light switch that needed a user manual um, <laughs> to install. Uh, so, um, but it's actually pretty clever because um, turn on and then um, in like a lot of places with teenagers, they have a tendency not to turn the light out when they leave, but this <laughs> oh does it gosh. automatically. <laughs> this will, will dim it because it's motion sensing. So what do you think about those kind of light switches? Are you a fan of those? <laughs> well, I think, I think you can assume what my, what my feedback on that's going to be, but it's that if you need a user manual to use your light switch, the whole, the whole purpose of, you know, living in a home is to come home and relax, have time with family, eat some food, reflect, watch as the sun moves across the apartment or house and maybe read and, 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 and relax or work from home and, and have things there for you. But every extra thing that causes you to think about it more than necessary uh, is, is, you know, it's kind of like, I, I don't want to have to be a system administrator to live in my own home. <laughs> Although if I am a system administrator, I think it would be delightful to design a, a, just a, a wonderful classic home. And so uh, I was with my, my old friend and colleague in Minneapolis, and he spent a whole summer redoing a, you know, an old house. And I, you know, he's super high tech. He, he runs a website host for a living um, and it's very popular. I just, I went in there thinking he was going to really install this extra fancy gear. And in mm -hmm. reality, he had kind of redone all the electrical 
and he had dimmers on lights and he had little HVAC controls and everything was just the smallest amount of user interface possible. And it was delightful. It was like, wow, I did not expect. And, and when I asked him about, you know, how he runs his website host, he said, he said he just engineers it so that there's very little things that can fail. And then he, you know, goes out on road trips a lot and, and just makes sure everybody's happy. And he said if he had raised all this venture capital to try to make the best website host, he would have had this huge team of people, many of whom weren't really doing anything. Middle <laughs> managers would have come in. The whole thing would have been acquired by some random company and then it would have been shut down. And really, he said he's making this for people. He wants people to have a web host for 16 years. He wants to be able to not care about the electricity in the house for 16 or 50 or 100 years. So why add all this extra stuff in it? And I thought about that a lot because let's say you're, you're you know, I, I did have a friend that had a really smart home. I would go to his house and I'd have to download an app, authenticate in through him or mm -hmm. remember a username, get a mm -hmm. guest account, and then I could turn off the lights in my bedroom. <laughs> Who wants to do that at midnight when you're trying to go to sleep, especially if they're, you're there on a work trip? Right, you know, right. it's, it's just, I think the, 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 the middle is quite, wonderful if you can have a light switch that you can easily turn on and off with the tap of a finger and a five-year-old can do it and if you want to do something extra special you can hook into it if you wanted to yeah uh, that's and a change good it way to do it yeah right yeah yeah so we have uh at christmas time we did a thing where we had this little switch that was audio uh thing i forget, no, no it's connected to alexa so we could actually turn the christmas lights on the tree off and on just by commands Mm -hmm. That was it. Was the simplest user face you could imagine. You just say, you know, lights off, Alexa, lights off, Alexa, lights on, and everybody instantly, you know, learned it, mm -hmm. loved it. Uh, it was much easier than having to walk all the way over and trying to find a switch and stuff. And so, in that sense, it was a superior um, interface than the light switch on the wall was. Mm -hmm. But it did require. Um, you know the wake, the wake, knowing the wake name. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that might be something that's kind of an in between level yeah. of an interface. It is an in between until you're in a house and your partner's sleeping, and you don't want to wake them up, and it's three in the morning, and you have to tell Alexa to turn off the lights. And you know how it takes a little bit of a loud voice to do that. You know, they're a light sleeper and they wake up, right? So there's, I, you know, I was giving a talk in um, at Isis Kais University in in South Korea and in I was talking about automated light controls, geofence based automated light controls. So when you get home, the geofence of your house understands that your um, cell phone has gotten there because your Wi Fi connects to the Wi Fi router. And then it tells the house through an IRC network to turn on the lights when you get into the geofence area. Or if you're five minutes away from the geofence area that's your house, turn on the lights. And I was telling this and Don Norman like stood up in the front row and just told me <laughs> how wrong I was. And I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Um, cause I was like, well, this is great. Like I get a critique from somebody who's designed things that have edge cases. And, um, he's like, well, what if you have a birthday party? And then, you know, and the, the light automatically goes on, or he just kind of threw out some random edge cases where it wouldn't work. And it's interesting. Cause it's like, on the one hand, it is so cool to be able to have something like turn on and off the Christmas tree lights. Right. Because that's like, it's a gimmick. It's fun. It's interesting, it's entertaining, fun for the whole family, and it's also something that you don't have to live with for more than a couple months. So your ability to get to the, those edge cases is far reduced, and it's just a fun toy. You know, somebody in the family is probably going to get into to programming because of that, you know, if, if, if you leave it around too long, you know. and um, But on the other hand, if you have a house where that's already set up and you don't have control over it or you don't know how it's set up, um, and somebody just doesn't want the smart technology, then I, I just feel like people should have a, a choice. And it, the technology in the home is so much better now than, than what it was, you know, let's say in the 80s when you had to pay like $50,000 to like get your smart home or Bill Gates had to have the people install the smart home. On the other hand, you know, I grew up in three different smart homes and then built a couple smart homes. And when I was little, my dad would just have an X10 controller onto the wall and he did very simple stuff with just timers. So he mm -hmm. noticed that like, 
I wouldn't want to go to bed at 8 p.m. And that was my bedtime. So he put the X10 controller plugged into a wall, plugged into a lamp behind a big, heavy bookshelf that I couldn't move. And it would turn on this little nightlight, this orange nightlight at 8 p.m. And I couldn't argue with the light. <laughs> and so when that light <laughs> went on, I had to go to bed. And he did these just very goofy things where the light coming on meant a thing, but it was never like a human disembodied female voice telling you to do something. It was just, here's the light. Um, and I just loved the simplicity of, and the universality of, you know, we, we had friends from Japan coming over and they're like looking at the light being like, oh, what's that for? And we could tell them. Um, but you could have all sorts of like small nuanced kind of info synesthesia moments embedded into your home by simple timers that don't require a lot of extra and still give you a meaningful piece of information that's useful to people within the home, not necessarily understandable to those who are visiting, but also not distracting to those visiting either. It's kind of this delicate balance, I guess. Yeah. I was at first um, not uh, very, well, not enthusiastic at all, but when cars switched from keys to start to the fobs, <laughs> yeah. I thought mm -hmm. that was like, that was a step backwards. But I actually have become much more um, enthusiastic about fobs now. And one of the things that they don't do is it's really hard to lock them into the car, which is what was always happening with <laughs> keys. When, uh -huh. You know, it's like you would lock, you forget the keys and lock it and be inside. That hardly ever happens anymore because they're smart enough to know that they're still inside. So, so, um, so there, for me, that's an example where the fob is actually the simpler technology yeah. that the key is. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Um, unless they run out of batteries. So they just need of to course. let you know when they're going to run out of batteries so you don't get exactly. stranded in your Tesla in the middle of nowhere right. on a hike or whatever. But uh, other than that, the fob is so cool because you can just tap to go and it unlocks everything. And, and you don't even tap. Reduces. I don't know. The, you just get we, near. You just yeah. get near. Just get near. Yeah. In yeah. Most of them, I mean, like in the later ones with the fobs, even if the batteries do die, mm -hmm. you can just hold the NFC or RFID uh, to a little place on your dashboard and you can start it up even with a dead battery. Ah, there we go. So yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, it's right. like, you know, it's kind of one of those principles of, of, of calm technology. A, a device should work even when it fails, you know, kind yeah. of like a escalator Failed. becomes stairs when it, when it, when yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And I think so, that, exactly. that backup plan is just so, so generous, you know, that, um, that it feels safe, you know? Right. So, um, Amber, what's, what's your second cool tool? Okay. My second cool tool is inside the car and also on sewing machines, uh, and also on trash cans. It's the foot pedal. Um, foot pedal is something that we've forgotten about when we switched into the, the computer mouse, but Doug Engelbart's early mouse uh, in what, 1960, 1965 actually did have a foot pedal. So you could scroll down the screen. Um, the foot pedal is so cool because it makes use of an extra appendage of our body. You can work with it without having to see it. It's kind of a peripheral tool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for sewing machines, for, you know, uh, social distance door opening, you can I'll press something and throw something in the trash. And especially on a car. I mean, we use it all the time. We don't even think about it. Um, and now gamers are starting to get it back with like little pedals <laughs> that they're, that they're, uh, that they're having with their computer so that they can, um, you know, send responses to people funding them on, on, uh, any of these streaming platforms. So I love the foot pedal cause we all have feet and, uh, that's still a user interface. So what's really interesting, I spent a lot of time in Asia in remote parts where they were um, non-modern times, and the foot uh, was not just the foot, but also the toes. So people, uh, people, uh, craftsmen would hold things with their feet as if they had hands another set of hands because they could use their toes to grip things. And so using your feet was as common as using your hands in making things. Um, your feet could be a vice to hold things mm -hmm. um, to uh, mostly it's kind of like stationary, but they would use them in ways that we have forgotten now. So it makes perfect sense that you would also kind of move that into um, high tech where um 
you, and again, it may not just be like the foot in a simple club-like way, but there may actually be articulations possible. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just thinking about, um, I've been doing a lot of studies of Japanese culture and history, and especially like um, small towns that have produced the same very high quality artisanal object at scale over the past 800 or 1000 years. Um, and I grew up with uh, my dad's friends who were from Japan in the television industry. So it was very, uh, always looking at like, wow, look at these amazing um, bowls that are being made that are almost transparent, that are, that are, that are turned into lacquerware. How are they doing this at, at human scale? And it's uh, foot powered lathes. And then also mm -hmm. um, an amazing uh, system that kind of like uh, grinds up clay uh, that's just powered by the river, just like these very simple affordances that slowly produce these delicate objects consistently and how lovely it would be to use a wood, a foot powered wood lathe uh, that's mm -hmm. that you've had in your family for 500 years, you know, how, mm -hmm. how lovely that is, how, how efficient mm -hmm. and, and, um, and also like, uh, just human scale that is. Yeah. There's a guy in England who makes a little automaton, um, sculptures, ones that have little movements, and he uses a foot power scroll saw. Mm. Is that Tim Hunkin? Yeah, I think. So. Uh, I'm not sure. No, uh, no, it's not him. There's another guy um, who has m more of a woodworking kind of background, and the scroll saw because you you know it's just kind of up and down. It doesn't need to go very fast, mm -hmm. and so you actually can power that with your foot without much um, effort or training. Um, and so that's a lovely example of um, both using another appendage and also having a kind of a slower, more primeval source of power. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I think about that a lot because I really, really enjoyed woodshop probably and, and architecture class in, in school and just how all of the kind of just like musical instruments too, how everything was was shaped in a certain way. And when you had a really good tool how you it would be an extension of yourself and you would just harmonize with it and produce these beautiful objects more and more efficiently and you could be alone with these tools and um i don't i don't know how to describe the kind of time but it was this almost like decorated human time like you felt just i don't know it, it, it's it's just very satisfying um and you know one of the things is like having a pottery shop or having a wood shop, like being able to have that kind of hobby in a garage, uh, mm -hmm. just like feels so neat. You're in a communication with yourself, kind of like a kid on the playground, seeing how far you can go a little bit further each time. And it's not, it's not capable of being mastered. So you could work on this forever and teach it to somebody, but you have to do it kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis and how lovely that is, how hard mm -hmm. that is to automate. Yeah. So, um, so Amber, tell us about your third uh, cool tool. <laughs> okay, so we're switching into a uh, super futuristic here. Um, <laughs> there is a small startup that I kind of discovered called Unlock Protocol, and I met uh, Julian, uh, who's the founder of it, back in in the indie web days. So I don't know how much everybody knows about the indie web, but the indie web movement was something that was kind of founded by uh, me and Tantek. Chellick and uh, Crystal Beasley and Aaron Parecki. And the idea was that unlike today, where you just post on other services and they keep your information, you would post on your own site and syndicate elsewhere. And so this would be this um, it, it kind of going back to run a server in your closet and run your own website, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and so I was thinking, you know, over time, like we went very centralized. And so, you know, to predict the future, sometimes you can just flip the, flip the axis and so the future becomes decentralization so the question is like you know right now if you want to sponsor somebody online you use patreon and patreon takes a cut and if patreon decides they don't like you they can shut you down and you might make your living on patreon or ebay or or only fans for instance um and it's very hard so I was very interested in seeing a generation of the web which just hadn't been picked at for many years at least since the 70s and 80s where people were starting to build protocols instead of just APIs and on kind of the web stack. And that like email, 
where POP IMAP SMTP protocol allows anybody with a Gmail account to email somebody with a Yahoo account and vice versa. That level is very interesting to me, that interoperability, agnostic interoperability. And, and with you know, Twitter and Facebook, you can't tweet somebody and have them receive it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was kind of researching as a, as a Mozilla fellow, I was looking at the, one of the error codes that was not filled out on the web, which is the 402 payment required error. It said reserved for future use. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what is this? You know, um, why isn't there a good protocol for the web? This is, you know, we got eBay and PayPal and Venmo and a zillion different ways to pay people, but there's all a lot of intermediaries. So unlock protocol is a protocol that allows you to put a lock of content on your own site and have somebody unlock it with a credit card or crypto. Um, and there's no intermediary. So even if the company goes out of business, you can still make a living off of sites that you run um, w without all of that extra. And, and Interledger is another protocol that's working on this. You know, IPFS Filecoin is also a way of kind of making sure that that data is around because uh, the web decays. But I just like to find people that are thinking about this early on before... Uh, you know, when it's not cool to think about, you know, and I think for a while, we're like, it's all centralized. And I was like, where are the people thinking about decentralization, token gates, memberships as NFTs, you know, these kind of like weird new community models that would that would start to crop up. And so that's why I'm interested in unlock protocol and protocols as tools in general. Um, for, for and what is the status of unlock protocol right now, if somebody wanted to use it or employ it what, what would they need to do sure uh, you just go to the unlock protocol website and you can click on the app and a lot of people are using metamask wallet as a kind of uh, crypto wallet for the web mm -hmm. so you would just authenticate with your web wallet and then you could make a lock and either embed that onto your site and have some sort of content get unlocked based on that or you could have a little miniature little checkout page that um, that could basically token gate a link. So let's say I have a Dropbox doc and I want people to pay a little bit of money for it. They could go through and pay. Um, so it's all live and it's been live and working since 2018. So I'd say it's probably the earliest version of what we're going to see happen online in terms of kind of token gated communities and peer-to-peer -peer payments and things like that. And, and the unlocking... Uh the tokens, these are all crypto tokens, is that correct? Yeah. Any, does, does it require crypto? Is there a version that doesn't use crypto? Yeah, you can also use a credit card. So uh, I believe it's the first uh, platform that allows you to pay for a kind of crypto NFT membership with a credit card, which is interesting. So it's, it's kind of trying to provide a web two ramp up to web three. Um, and it's not just Ethereum, although any ERC-20 token is supported by this, but also Matic and uh, XDAI, which are more eco-friendly networks, are supported. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, it's, you know, a lot of, there's a grant program. So if people have ideas for, like, how to extend the platform, it's very, very open source. You can apply and get a grant. And it's just trying to... You know, I think all of these newer Web3 companies, some of them are very gold rushy and excited, but there's a kind of spirit of play that's going on. Like, again, like kids on a playground trying to see what's possible. And that is such an interesting feeling. It's, it's, it's a culture. Um, and whenever I find those, I find just bizarre, almost surrealistic things happening. Like, I think the best use of Unlock Protocol is probably the dinner DAO, where it's just eight people that buy a season ticket to a dinner and then you just go to dinners with each other for six <laughs> months once a month but it's a way of doing a, a decentralized autonomous organization in a goofy way you get to see the edge cases together you can discuss it over dinner instead of you know let's try running our bank on this and and then people's money's at risk yeah it's, it's a playground right so it's it's probably the easiest playground shape that you can use the kind of a primitive to start off this kind of new section of, of the economy. Um, and it's something I'm just heavily uh, researching with, with the Mozilla Fellowship. Like what are the new ways of, of being and collaborating online through money and web economics and 
tokens and NFTs, you know, so it's, it's a fascinating thing to watch right now. It sounds really cool. Um, so one question, if you're using Ethereum, I know that like the, the gas fees can be kind of high. Is there ways so that you can use this unlock protocol so you could pay like, you know, 50 cents or a dollar to access an article or a little game or something? Yeah, not actually, have to pay a fee? that's great. That's uh, yeah, it's a great question. If you uh, deploy your lock on the Matic network, Polygon Matic mm -hmm. network or mm -hmm. XDAI, um, mm -hmm. you can, uh, charge very little and the gas fees are like fractions of cents. So that's a, mm -hmm. that's a way of getting around the giant gas fees. So when Ethereum is hot, you can, uh, use other networks and when it's not so hot, you can use it directly. Um, but it all goes into your MetaMask wallet. So it works out. Okay. Um, and then you can always test it on the rink B network, which allows you to just have fun during hackathons and, um, but yeah, that's that's the idea is, you know, in this kind of new world that's forming, there's all sorts of new vocabulary, like gas fees, like, you know, uh, so mm -hmm. how, how do you make something that gracefully allows people to still interact during different market and cultural conditions? <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a funny thing because, you know, it, everybody's trying different ways. Uh, and experiments to get to it. And um, it's just, it's fun to watch and, and you know, be a part of, of that experiment, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I, I have a friend who is involved with that uh, animated cartoon series called Stoner Cats. Have you mm -hmm. heard of that? Mm -hmm. And and so they, they, it was really interesting, the funding model, instead of doing this typical studio thing, they just sold uh, NFTs of the Stoner Cats and they raised $9 million. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the gas fee, they were all using MetaMask to buy it, but the gas, the, the gas fee, MetaMask sets a, an estimated gas fee mm -hmm. and it wasn't keeping up with the demand. So the gas fee was too low. So a lot of people were buying these, you know, $800 uh, cats and the transaction wouldn't go through because the gas fee wasn't enough. They'd get the, the ether back that would reach them, but the gas fee wouldn't. It's like a car. It'll take you if you're driving from LA to San Francisco and your car runs out of gas halfway through, you, you spent the money on the gas, but you didn't get there. There's still, I mean, I feel like we're still kind of in the wild west days where this stuff is not that easy to use and people are like confused by what, by what's going on with a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. We were watching that very intently and you know a lot of us were like well they could have just deployed it on a different network and used unlock for the whole thing and it would have gone through and it would have been fine oh man um they just didn't know no and that's kind of a thing it's like i th i feel that sometimes people are so quick to like they're like oh it's nfts nft mania we'll just hire this random team and we'll do the thing and it's like wait 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 <laughs> think through the kind of ocean wave type situation that happens in this industry. ETH goes up, gas goes up, it goes down, whatever. But think about the edge cases that could happen and plan for them. And I think, you know, calm tech type thinking in this industry becomes super crucial because you're dealing with millions of dollars. So think about like do a sample sale first mm -hmm. and, and have your first wave of maybe 10 people have the super special edition thing and then have the larger sale and then go through and see what happened um, and go through people who've been through, you know, the ICO craziness in, um, in uh, 2018, like just have, have more people involved and, and try it out. And it's just the same as like you, when people are so fast and they rush and they have assumptions, there's, there's kind of people who think more at the abstract level, uh, and then those details can can destroy you. You know, errors and smart contracts and things like that can take you down. And so, it's just about this this kind of dedicated thing. Like um, my old boss at Esri, Jack Dangerman, said, you know, problems are like aphids; they're born pregnant. He used to <laughs> he used to work at a um, a landscape um, company, his parents' landscape company, and that's why he grew such a company that's that's more like a a a plant gardening company, really. Um, he said, look, if, if, if you look at the problems, you start to see what they are, just be very careful because especially I think in crypto, a very tiny aphid uh, can get you. 
because at mm-hmm. scale, everything counts. And yes. uh, so just, you know, looking through it. And I think some people also are just very aesthetically oriented. They look really cool and it looks exciting and they want to get in. And then some people behind the scenes, you know, Unlock really wants to be a utility, you know, long term, mm-hmm. the thing used behind the scenes for things doesn't need to draw all of the flashy attention to itself and then and, and go out very quickly. So, you know, how do you provide stability uh, over time and think through those things really early on? That's a different way of thinking. It's, it's more philosophical. There's some mathematics. There's some human cultural pieces. Um, how, how do you switch from that all at once, dee, 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 you know, type of thinking that we get when we're excited to that kind of overarching um, looking at a mountain and considering all the different pieces and how they'll fit together. That kind of design thinking is is hard, but if we don't do it, uh, people's lives are, will be at risk. I mean, it, it's becoming crucial that the kind of code debt that we have in some of these systems to uh, to work on it. Yeah, definitely. Um, Amber, could you, uh, we're just to, in the interest of time, could you tell us about Ableton software? Sure. I don't, it's I don't really know what it is at all, so. Sure. Tell us okay, from the, the get-go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The fourth tool is Ableton software. Ableton is uh, a, a way of processing signals for audio. So this is mm-hmm. what people use to make music. But Okay. Is, is, is it a company? Is it a protocol? Is it a um, brand? Uh, 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 just give me a little bit more specifics on that. Sure. Okay. So Ableton is software for your computer. And what it does, it's just, it's a digital audio workstation. Um, okay. But it's been around since 2001, 20 years ago. And it looks very similar to what it looked like in the past. And it's very interesting because it was built from kind of homemade software. Um, and I think when we look at music, like we look at a lot of software and it's not, always well built but with audio you have to do a good job because you're working with something invisible like sound is invisible and when you visualize it it's waves and all you're doing with signal processing is changing the shape of the wave and that changes the sound and then changing more shapes so that when you play multiple sounds at the same time they don't conflict with each other and then changing them more to give them the a weird overtone or mood that you want to give them and then finally packaging it up so it still retains its flavor when you play it over a crappy car speaker or in a bad restaurant. And so would this be music? Would this be software that would help musicians edit yeah. um, music primarily? Yeah, you can record into it. You can arrange it. You can mix. You can master. You can crossfade. You can do whatever. Um, but it looks, the reason why I like it is when you open it up, it just is horrifying looking to somebody who's never used it. It is the most utility oriented thing. And for me, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it should be easy to use on the first try. And I don't agree necessarily when you're when you're working with something like Photoshop or Ableton Live. It looks really confusing. And then what happens is there's suddenly this this like aha moment after a couple months of using it or somebody being kind and showing you how to use it. And then everything is exactly in the right shape and place. And it just feels like it matches your brain, everything you want to do. I and would so, not say that about Photoshop. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Photoshop, uh, <laughs> Photoshop keeps moving everything around. It's really frustrating and it's really bloated, but live. And it's not intuitive in the <laughs> least, even after years of using it. Yeah, yeah. And so live is interesting because unlike a lot well, of software. A- Ableton is, is live or live is Ableton or what? what, yeah. what is Ableton Live is Ableton Live is the name yeah. of it. Okay. The developer's Ableton, the software is live. After a while, you know, usually when people update software, it gets worse and people get mad and they want the old version. Every time Ableton doesn't update, it's just like a little bit better. And there's another feature that you wanted, but it's hidden in this beautiful way that like if you use the feature a lot, you can get it out. Like everything is 
it's just this humongous joy to use. Um, it sounds like that you use it yourself. Are you a, are you a <laughs> musician yourself? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't share any of that on on my professional account. But my dad um, was an audio engineer and built several thousand synthesizers with uh, Niall Steiner um, back when he was in high school. Cool. These are synthesizers used by like Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Pink Floyd and stuff, and uh my dad was like 16 when he when he made all these and made a bunch of microphones speakers my mom played piano so when i grew up uh we didn't we didn't watch tv because my parents put it on the air as as at the tv station so when we got home i didn't really have a lot of visual culture it was all like sound and cds and sitting next to these speakers and watching my dad solder stuff and so when i started making my own music you know i had very good ears and I had learned a lot about signal processing from my dad and I decided that I would go digital instead of instead of totally analog um, just to give myself a kind of constraint and so I actually make things by just recording weird sounds chopping them up uh, sounds like a doorknob squeaking or like somebody saying something silly and kind of put them together in this sound collage uh, and then put video to it um, but having this kind of companion, uh, almost a companion species that's, that's been around for a long time and, and really understands what you need, just is kind of in the face of so much other like startup based software that just kind of decays on you after a while. This is kind of like a solid rock that you can stand on for years. And I really, I just wanted to share like a good pattern of software development that they mm. that they seem to have ascribed to and uh and made it work so what is the um the cost of it for if somebody wanted to get started with it what would they have to pay uh let's see um it's about for the live suite 749 dollars um, is that a one-time fee or is that an annual fee? That's a one-time fee. They don't have one of those weird subscription models. But if you if there's a new version like 11 that comes out, then you pay a little bit to update. But I would say it's not the kind of software where you just download it. Uh, it's part of like a community. It's like you get into the community and you become a part of a culture over time. And it evolves with you and you evolve with it with others. And I think that's the special thing about it is like, I do know a lot of people that are like, I'm a software engineer. I want to make music all of a sudden. So I'm going to buy all this gear and I'm going to, and then I'm going to sit and wait for the right moment and make perfect stuff. And I was like, no, 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 stop. Like, what does it feel like to listen to something? Like, what is this? Like, are you going to play? Or like, there's a lot of people who just want to make something that's so perfect you know, kind of like people who want to rewrite an operating system or something. I have this, this platonic idea in their head, but it's like this thing where like spend years with it, you know, like have it be a part of your life. Um, I think that's, it's just a completely different world that you get into when you're working with like pure aesthetics and, um, and moods and feelings. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just like a picture doesn't have to be perfect to convey an emotion and to, express something that you can't say declaratively, that you can't say in words. Um, and I think for a lot of programmers who are used to being very articulate and declarative, um, approaching music from that kind of unknowing perspective is, is a mystery and it's interesting and exciting. And I think Ableton is a fun way to, to approach it. Do you know how Ableton Live compares to say some of the other, um, music editing software like uh, Logic. Yeah. Because um, I know Brian Eno is a big fan of Logic using that. So so wh where does that sort of fit in? Sure. I mean, I use Logic too. I, I can use all the, the major stuff. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, I, I spent three years writing a book on sound. It's kind of like sound design and calm technology and how sound affects people and, you know, what sound is. And once you understand the kind of fundamental building blocks of sound, Every software is very similar, and so you can use any of it. You could use any synthesizer, you could use any keyboard, you could use any editing. And I do like Logic as well, but I think the density and the feeling of Ableton is just like so pleasant that, you know, I think I've kind of attached it to my brain in a way that 
you just kind of like thinking about like a Ruby developer or like a PHP developer is like different brains get attracted to different programming languages. And sometimes, you know, if Brian Eno, it was the first thing that he used, he's going to have these kind of almost when you're a kid, when you like get it to a new goal, like a kind of dopamine that's attached to a specific process. And once you have enough dopamine attached to a specific piece of software, it's going to be your software, you know? Um, or if your brain is shaped differently, like for video editing, I will always use Final Cut Pro because Ableton, or sorry, um, because Adobe Premiere doesn't work with my brain shape. And as hard as I try, I can't get those neural pathways to give me the, the feeling of ease that somebody who's has a different shaped brain might might really like. So it's it's all about like, um, I guess I just know enough about Ableton, the founders just be like, yes, I love this so much. And I love their, their ideology. And I love how long it's been around. Like, I think I have this like, respect for the tools that they've made and, and how anybody can make a tool and a plugin for it very quickly and and have it have that same kind of universal feeling to it. Yeah. I'm with you with on not having the brain match with Premiere. It just does not compute <laughs> in my head. <laughs> yes, um, yes. But Lightroom does. Mm, Lightroom, totally. which is also by Adobe, is like, yes, I just love it. It's really great. So It's um, incredible. Um, yeah, it's much better than Photoshop. So, um, oh, wow, this is really, really wonderful. If um, Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Sure. Uh, well, I'm a Mozilla fellow, so I'm researching web economics. And so part of what I'm studying is kind of um, a little bit of that, that 402 payment required error about like, how can we mm -hmm. make money work better online? Uh, a little bit of, you know, the, the origin of micropayments and uh, where that came from in, in the 60s. Um, and then also, you know, that kind of goes along with you know, interledger and um, unlock and all these different kind of new technologies and protocols that are that are showing up. So that's that's part of the work. But I think the larger work is continuing to make um, kind of strides in calm technology, which was a framework developed in the the nineties at Xerox Park by John Seely Brown and and right. Rich Gold. Rich Gold, yeah, yeah. And they, the late rich gold, the late rich gold and yeah. Mark Weiser, who's also the late Mark Weiser. And so John mm -hmm. Seely Brown is still around, has applied mm -hmm. this, this framework to a lot of things. But during my uh, thesis on mobile phones in, in, in 2007, 2008, I stumbled upon this just very small research paper uh, by, by these amazing thinkers. And it was written in a way that just seemed like it was written today. It's just timeless human technology universals. They say, you know, the, the fourth era of computing is, is many devices will share a single person. And then in the beginning, many people shared one device. And the maturity is when, um, you know, the, the, a device takes the least amount of attention and only when necessary, you know, that you can embed information and your periphery. I was just reading this and, and saying, oh my gosh, most of these people died before they saw, uh, you know, the, the ubiquitous computing era. And then a lot of what we think of as ubiquitous computing and smart objects has been built super poorly. And now, as, as Freud would say in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents, we are marred by a future of ill-fitting prosthetics. And how unfortunate that is, because we could have uh, these more harmonious systems around us um, that don't have to assume that we need certain things, where we still have agency and we have smarter humans instead of smarter objects. Um, so I was super inspired by that. So uh, more recently, like very large companies have been showing up and saying, you know, we have a monopoly in this in this market, and now we're stuck because people don't like our stuff. Like, what do we do? And just doing little workshops and um, just trying to revive what was come up with in in an era. Uh, where at Xerox Park you could kind of make the future and then understand what problems the future might have and then write about how these these futures could be designed better, I suppose. Um, so that's that's kind of the big work. That gets applied to pretty much 
everything I do and the companies that I advise and, and the future writing I'm going to work on. I think. And, and where big, would people find, are you writing out loud or, or are you posting is where would people find um, what you are doing today? What's the sure. easiest place to go? The easiest place to go is you could go to calmtech.com, which probably won't change very much because it's it's supposed to be around for 30 or 40 years and, and not go out of date, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can go on my medium. I have about like almost 50 articles uh, detailing like various tip- different applications of either web economics or, or calm tech. Um, and then every and once under, in a while. Your, under your name there? Yeah, on, on Case Organic. You just look up Case Organic on Medium. Uh, it, it's there. And then on my website, caseorganic.com. And I link to things through through Twitter as well. I would like to write a lot more. Uh, I just have to figure out a, uh, a way to do more writing. So AI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, isn't that the solution? We're just going to yeah, have AI's, AI's write it for us, I think. We'll just curate. Yeah, we just curated. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the thing is 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 I think most of the stories of AI are 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 the aesthetics of movie making, but in but in reality, it's if a reasonable machine learning algorithm can get you seventy percent there, so that you don't have to stare at an empty page and you do the final finesse that is impossible to 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 automate, then you have a system that's working alongside. And I hate the I hate the phrase AI. I hate artificial intelligence. I would like assistive intelligence or like assistive buddy, just just like a companion species. You know, a dog is an assistant, right? Like a car is an assistant, but we're still making some of the decisions. So I hope that we uh, change out of the, you know the billion dollar uh, the fancy technology industry to being like actually all this stuff in the movies really sucks to use in its current. Uh, you know, um, manifestation. Let's 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 have it be a little bit more yeah. like coming home. Uh, well, I, I I think that um, you know people are young people are always saying, well, you know, what's what should I get into? Well, I, I think there's going to be a huge thing of the in, of interfacing with these uh, various kinds of uh, species of AIs. Just 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 that, j- j- just as you were saying, you, they're going to be your assistants and working with us, but we don't have very good interfaces for that. And um, you know, we were talking about the Alexa uh, Christmas light switch. Well, that's that's a very simple one command thing. Once you have more than one command, audio yes. is very, very restrictive. You don't yes. know what the options are, blah, blah, blah. But coming up with interfaces to AI, yes, that's the future. Yeah, I would encourage people to study furniture design <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and and some sort of liberal arts. Like study the things that aren't being funded, um, because it's it's kind of like a, if we throw away the past, we will be reminded very expensively uh, why we built that to begin with, and yeah. um, it'll be an interesting future. That's for sure. <laughs> Our last podcast guest was um recommending that everybody have an upright piano in their house because it's furniture that can make music and i thought yes 100 percent, 100 percent. that is it's always, that is... always available you don't have to turn it on you just walk by and you can play it and i thought huh. furniture that makes music okay i got it i love it amber this was fantastic thank you so much yeah this was great thanks again for having a great podcast and doing everything you do and I'll see you around. Hey, everybody, it's your co-host, Mark. And I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, The best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cooltools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. 
It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorn, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week. <music>